We've been speaking for a long time now, and we've been focusing on our theme, Building for Our Future, on our glorious past. And uh, did we have a glorious uh, Sunday last week? Wasn't that awesome? Uh, the Centennial Committee needs to be, just uh, slap them on the back, but not hard. Just thank them. They did such an awesome job. And so we've had centennial moments where we reflect on the past, and we reflect on the past. I want to turn and change gears. Uh, I don't want to just focus on our past anymore. I really want to look at the future of the church. So I'm talking about what the Bible has to say in a thing called predictive prophecy. Now, most of you might not be aware of this, but predictive prophecy, the Bible, at the time it was written, 50% of what was in the Bible was actually predictive. It was predicting something to come true. Now, a, a prophecy is something where you just tell history before it happens, and the Bible is full of it. Now, some of you are aware of some of the prophetic books of the Bible. Now, of that 50% at the time it was written, about 25% has been fulfilled, so that leaves about 25% of the Bible that is yet still to be fulfilled. To me, that's an amazing fact. That's an amazing fact. The Bible is full of promises, predictions of things in the future. And I know some of you are aware, you said, yes, I've read the book of Revelation. Can't say that I understand it, but I certainly have read it, and I know that there's a lot of things yet to be fulfilled. Well, today, I want to take our focus on just one area. We're not going to cover that full 25% of the Bible. Uh, that would take us quite a while. But I want to look at the prediction of the church. This is really important. The church is neither mentioned nor predicted in the Old Testament. Some of you who took the challenge to read through your Bible in a year, like two years ago, when you read through the Old Testament, you realize there is no reference at all to the church. There is actually no prediction of the church. It's just not there. The very first reference or prediction is by Jesus Christ. Jesus predicted the church. Now, some of you are aware that Jesus met with his disciples, and he said to the disciples, hey, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? And uh, they replied, hey, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Because of this question, some years ago, I took my video camera, and I went out on the streets, and I talked to people. And I said, well, in your opinion, who is Jesus? And I said, first I said, can I put you on video? I'm going to show you at church next Sunday. And, and so then they said, yeah, I, I got... Some, a lot of people refused, but I got every imaginable response. But I was shocked that I had more who hit the nail on the head than missed it. I thought that was just great. I, I just thought that was great. Jesus throws the question out to the disciples. Who do people say that I am? And they start saying, well, the people on the street some think you're John the Baptist, because at the time he asked this, John the Baptist had already been executed, and they thought he was raised from the dead. Some were saying Elijah, because in the Old Testament it said Elijah was yet to come. Still others said Jeremiah or one of the prophets. They, get, they think you're a prophet, Jesus. But Jesus then zeroes in on his audience, which is the disciples, the twelve. And he says, but what about you? Who do you say... I am. Now they're kind of stumped and dumbfounded. No one is quick to raise their hand and answer this, and it seems that finally Simon Peter answers, as a spokesman for the group, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the great confession, folks. This is what our church is built on. The great confession, the great commandment, the great commission. This is it that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Now, in their minds, the Messiah was the one who was prophesied in the Old Testament that he was going to come and rescue, deliver, or save the nation Israel. At the time of the, the disciples, they are being oppressed by the Roman Empire, and they are dominating them, and, and they really think that he says, when he says you're the Christ, that he's the one that's going to throw off the Roman Empire and set up a kingdom that's been prophesied in the Old Testament. That's what they have in mind. He says, but not only are you that Messiah, 
You're the son of the living God. And Jesus is the Christ. That's why we call him Jesus Christ. But he's also the son of God. Now Jesus, quick to respond to him, Jesus replied, Oh, you are blessed. Blessed are you. Simon the son of uh, Jonah. Simon the son of Jonah. Some people said the name has been shortened to Johnson. (laughs) Son of Johnson. Okay. Simon the son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by man. But my father in heaven said, you know what? No one makes that confession without a sovereign, supernatural work of God. You see, I can't twist anyone's arm into believing in Jesus. I can make my case as logical. I can be as passionate. I can be weeping and crying that they would come into faith in Christ. But unless God does the work, you see, I'm just the messenger. I'm never held accountable for anyone else's salvation. I'm only held accountable for being faithful to share the good news. He says, you're blessed because the Father has ripped the blinders from your eyes and you see the truth. You believe. You've accepted the the reality. That is who I am. And then he makes this statement, and I tell you that you're no longer Simon. You are now Peter. Peter. Which means rock, a little stone, pebble. I used to call him Rocky. New nickname for Peter, Rocky. (laughs) And he says, on this rock. Now, there's two different words there. Same Petra, Petra and Petras. And the one is referring to Peter. He just got his name changed because of this great confession he made. And he says, upon this rock, he is not referring to Peter. He's referring to the great confession. When you made that confession, that is the bedrock of the church, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says, on this rock, and here's what I want, the prediction. Boom. Future tense. I will build. I will build. You see, he's he's introducing, he's predicting something here new. Future tense, something's going to take place that does not exist currently when Jesus speaks. He says, I will build, next part of that is, my church. The church is a whole new entity. It's It's not to Gentiles. It's not to Jews. It's a whole new entity. In fact, when... In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, give nobody offense. And then he he sums up all of mankind. Neither give offense to the Jew, nor to the Gentile, nor to the church of God. A whole new entity. The church actually did not exist in the Old Testament. It did not exist during the four Gospels. Do you realize in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, while Jesus is living, He is living in the Old Testament times. He's living under the law. In fact, in Galatians chapter 4, it says in verse 4, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son made under the law. What? He he lived under the law to redeem those who were under the law. The church didn't exist. Jesus is making a prediction. I am going to call out a new assembly of people that does not currently exist. It's a prophecy of the church. And then he tells us this. I like this part. And the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overcome it. The gates of Hades. Now, the gates, the doorway of the adversary who would come and attack the church. He says, listen, I am predicting victory for the church. How would you like to be a part of something that God says is going to succeed? Yeah, I think every hand would go up. That's the church. That's the church. God says here, the gates of hell will not overcome the church. It just won't do that. Now, I want to turn to the purpose of the church. The next thing is the purpose of the church. It's predicted to be a spiritual entity. I move to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus has died, been buried, and raised from the dead, and he's about to ascend back into heaven, and he's giving some final instructions to the disciples, and he says, but you will receive power 
when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, I put a dove as the Holy Spirit because at the time when Jesus was baptized, he descended like a dove. And so I use that, that as, as a, a, a reference of what it, to depict the Holy Spirit. But he says, the Holy Spirit, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And the purpose of the church, with the Holy Spirit coming upon them, one of the purposes that he gives us here is you will be witnesses. You're going to be God's spokesperson. It could be just like Peter. You're going to be sharing who you believe Jesus is to other people. You will be witnesses. You will testify to the saving grace of God in your life. You will be a witness. Now watch what it says. In Jerusalem. So I'll give you an idea. Put a star on the map where Jerusalem is. And he says, you're going to start out in Jerusalem. Our Jerusalem is Waterford. We are to share Jesus Christ with those in Waterford. Make your Jerusalem a little more pinpointed. Your Jerusalem is your neighborhood. Your Jerusalem is your house. When somebody visits you, you are to be the spokesperson for Jesus Christ in your Jerusalem. He goes on, he says, and at the same time in Judea and Samaria. Now, we not only as a church here, this is our Jerusalem, but it extends out to Waterford, uh, West Bloomfield, Commerce, Pontiac, uh, Clarkson. You, you see, it's the region. It's the region in which we are in. And then he says, hey, you will be a witness to the ends of the earth. We need the goods as our missionaries more than they need us. Because if I am going to have an impact with a gospel witness, and our church is going to do that, and promise of Jesus, if it's going to do that, we need somebody who's going to represent us to go. And they are representatives in Hungary. This is the purpose. God saved you to tell other people about Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the church in the age in which we live. There are other purposes, but that's the primary one. We, of course we are to fulfill the great commandment, to love the Lord our God with all our heart and love our neighbor as ourself. But it is also that we are to be witnesses. Now I'm talking about the beginning of the church. If it didn't exist in the Old Testament, and Jesus predicted that it was coming, when did it actually start and arrive? Well, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, just before those verses we just read, do not leave Jerusalem, stay put, but wait for the gift of the Father that the Father promised. Now, he's telling them to stay put because they're Galileans and they're down in uh, Judea. And he says, hey, down in the Jerusalem area, we don't want you to go back to Galilee yet. Hang in there, stay put. For the gift that the Father promised, which you've heard me speak about, the Holy Spirit. He says, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus had been resurrected. He's been on earth for 40 days. And so the disciples hear him say, hey, in a few days Jesus is going to ascend the Holy Spirit. We're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's going to immerse us somehow. The Holy Spirit is going to immerse us uh, just like water baptism. You're placed in the water. You're fully immersed. You come out. The, he's saying here, the Holy Spirit, you're going to be immersed in the Holy Spirit. You're going, to be, you're going to become something by the Holy Spirit. And he says, in a few days. Can you imagine the disciples sitting around? One day goes by. Okay, it's coming tomorrow. <laughs> Two days go by. I don't know what's going on here. Where is he? Three days. Boy, if he's like us, he's really impatient. Come on now, three days. How long do I wait? A few days. You didn't say a couple days, you said a few days. In my mind, a few days, three days, right? Or maybe more. Four days go by. Five days, six days, seven days. Hey, good grief, it's been a week. God, can't you hurry up? Isn't that the way we are? I think these disciples the same way. Eight days, nine days. On the tenth day, it just so happened that it coincided. It was the day of Pentecost. It was the day of Pentecost. Jesus said, in a few days, the Holy Spirit will come. In Acts chapter 2, it says, and when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one room, one place. Suddenly, the sound of a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. I, I don't know how to do that sound. 
All right, we got this blowing wind, and it's a hurricane type of wind blowing. And all of a sudden it says, and it came from heaven, and it was and filled the whole house. It must be like a whirlwind, a tornado going on in the room where they were sitting, and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, little tongues of fire. You know when you make a bonfire, we had a bonfire, my brothers and the guys in the family last Thursday night, and we had this fire. It was one of the best. I contributed to wood. All right, so it was one of the best. And that thing, that, that flame which is going, and my brother who's with us today, we have this gadget called the flamethrower. And you hook it up to a propane tank, and you ignite it. And literally, it throws a flame. I, I, could, I could toast the, the speaker there from here. I mean, it, and we can light just about anything up with that. Well, you light it up, and then you turn that thing off, and it's all flaming. And, and then there's, when the flames go up, there's these little tongues that go off. You ever notice that? Just a little tongue of fire, and then it dies out. Fl tongue flies off. These little tongues of fire, it seemed like, it doesn't say it was. It says, it seemed like they came, and they, they separated, and they rested on each one of them. They're on top of their head. Now, this artist painted whoever this uh, disciple is that was there bald. Can you imagine if you'd had hair on your head? <laughs> that would have been a little warm, huh? Yeah. Anyway, it says they weren't real fire, but it seemed to be fire. And it separated. And then it says all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit took up residency in their bodies. Their bodies became the temple of the living God. Something happened on that day. The church was born. And I know what you're thinking. Yeah, but you said it. Jesus said they would be baptized by the Holy Spirit, not just to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What is going on here? Well, this filling, occupying, taking control over them completely is a sign that they were baptized, but I know they were baptized by the Holy Spirit on that day because later in the book of Acts, in chapter 10 and 11, Peter has had a vision by God, letting down a sheet full of all kinds of unclean animals, and God says to Peter, arise, eat. And Peter says, this is, this, this just, I can't believe he says this. He says, not so, Lord. Well, wait a minute. When God tells you to do something, what, do you, what, what should you be saying? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He said, not so, Lord. Nothing ever unclean has passed my lips. He said, not so, Lord. And God says, what I have cleaned, don't you declare unclean. This was a picture that God was about to save a group of, of Gentiles, which the Jews believed were unclean. And God is saying, listen, with my salvation in Jesus Christ, they are cleansed, cleansed, and become part of the family of God. Peter goes out and he's preaching and there's Gentiles there and all of a sudden the, the Holy Spirit falls upon them too. He says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he came on us at the beginning. And then I remembered what the Lord had said, and we just quoted this from Acts chapter 1. John baptized with water, and you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, he's saying here, listen, I wanted to baptize them with water because they had already received the Spirit. They've been baptized with the Holy Spirit just like happened to us that's what he says. So if God gave them the same Holy Spirit that he gave us who believe, when did that happen? Back in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost. He's saying, they got what we got back in Acts chapter 2, and when we were filled, we were baptized. They are filled, they're baptized too. They're, we're all part of the body of Christ. The church began in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. He's saying, listen, if they've received the same Spirit, who was I to oppose God and forbid them water to be baptized because they have the same spirit as us? They came to faith in Jesus Christ. They should be water baptized too. And so the Gentiles were baptized in the na same name of Jesus Christ as the Jews who had previously been baptized because there are not two churches, a Jewish church and a Christian church. No, they are all one in Christ. We are neither Jew nor Gentile, but the church of God, but the church of God. So Peter baptized them. He baptized them. Now, 
I want to talk about the next thing about the church. Jesus predicted, I will build my church. And there was no church until Acts chapter 2. But there was just 12, maybe 120, because there's 120 gathered in the upper room. There's 120 people in the church. But the church begins to propagate. Now, I want to watch this. Watch this closely. That very same day in Acts chapter 2, it ends up telling us in verse, 42, or verse 41 that there were about 3,000 who were added to their number. Can you imagine that? 3,000 converts in one day, and they all get baptized. Oh, my goodness, that was one long service. And some of you complain if I'm five minutes over. <laughs> Can you imagine how long it took to baptize 3,000 people? I'm telling you what, it was more than one person doing the baptizing. <laughs> but we have reservations at the restaurant. <laughs> you better cancel them. <laughs> Got another one to baptize. 3,000 people are added to the church. What a magnificent start. Tells us then later in that same passage at the very end. And the Lord added to their number daily. Every day, every day people were joining the church. Why? They were accepting the word of God. They were believing in Jesus Christ, repenting of their sins, being baptized, and they were joining the church. He says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Every day. Every day. I go a little bit further in the book of Acts. I come to chapter 5 and I find this. More believed in the name uh, uh, in, the, in the Lord and were added to their number. I like that word. Added, added. They were adding. Look at added, added, added. And all these verses, each one, they're adding. Every day, they're, add, they're additions to the, the church. The church is growing. Now, in those days, the numbers of disciples was multiplying. It jumps from adding to multiplying in, in, in the book of Acts chapter 6. Adding, you know, you just take one number, you add to it another number. You know, add, to it, add to it. And I did this illustration before. I'm not going to do it again. But you'll remember where I, I went and I added one person. I got one person, brought him up. <laughs> And, and then that person, we both went out and got one. And, and then now there were, okay, two over there, two here. Th then we went out, and I added one more, but they all went out and added one. Wow, now they're multiplying, and I'm just adding. I'm just adding. You see, what happens is the church just adds people when you rely upon the leaders to do all the work. You just add. When the pastors and the disciples and, you know, and, the, and the early church prophets, when, when they were all doing all the work, they were adding. But when everybody says, you know what, I can share my faith too, they began multiplying, multiplying. And now in those days, the numbers of disciples were multiplying. Watch this. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Some people believe the church could have grown in this period of time anywhere to 10 to 15,000 people, maybe as high as 20,000 people. Is that amazing? The church. Because Jesus said he's going to build his church. He's going to build his church. Those who had been scattered because there was a persecution that broke out, God said, hey, you guys aren't doing what I told you. You're staying in Jerusalem. I told you and once, once the Holy Spirit comes, you're supposed to go to Samaria, Judea, and the ends of the earth. So he caused the persecution to take place, and now they're scattered, and those who were scattered were preaching the word wherever they went. So guess what happens? The church begins multiplying. It's multiplying. It's not just adding anymore. It's multiplying. The word is spreading. Did you catch that, though? The word is now that is spreading. It's the word. It's the word. And the church increased in numbers in Acts 9.31. We go a little bit further in the book of Acts, and the word of God continued to increase and spread. These two are now put together. The numbers are increasing because the Bible is increasing. The more I share the Bible, the more the number increases. You see what's going on here? That's the mission of the church. We're a Bible-preaching church because it's the Bible, the good news of Jesus Christ that, that delivers people from their sins as they believe in Jesus. And so as the word of a Redeemer, Jesus Christ, is being spread, the numbers are increasing. They're increasing. And so the churches were strengthened in their faith and they grew daily in their numbers in Acts chapter 16. Paul's on a missionary journey. He, he has now left the, that little star in Jerusalem to the circle in Judea, Samaria. Now he's in Europe. And, and it says and the, the, the church is just growing in numbers. It's growing in numbers. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely 
and grew in power. Oh, he says, no, not, not. it's just not people are believing. These are powerful Christians. Things are truly happening. I jump to the uh, epistle. I just picked this one in Colossians. In the book of Colossians, it says, all over the world. You get that? All over the world. Now, the world, in the context here, would have been the Roman Empire world because that's where the gospel is spreading through the whole Roman Empire. Whew. The whole known world that they knew of at that, ta- that ta- ta- at that time, all over the world, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and the truth. Wow. The propagation of the church. The propagation of church. You know, it continues. This story just continues. In the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, when you come to the end, the last two verses, I notice this. I'm just going to pick that last one up. Boldly, without hindrance, Paul preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you would expect it, like at the end of every movie, at the end of every book, to, to say the end. But it doesn't. There is no the end to the book of Acts. Because what God was doing in the book of Acts, causing the church to grow and multiply and increase, began to spread. It spreads through all of Europe. And it spreads from Europe to other continents. It, it just it spreads. The gospel is just spreading and spreading. You see, the continuation of the gospel... It began on Pentecost. We go to the end of the book of Acts and there's no the end because it just keeps on going. And for the last 2,000 years, the gospel has been preached somewhere, someplace on the planet by by preachers and teachers and, and by people in the church so that even to this very day, it is now we are that church that Jesus predicted he would build. It's us. We're the church. What I'm trying to say is he predicted you. <laughs> Isn't that great? We sang about it in a song, uh, the chosen. I've been chosen. We're chosen generation. We're, we're, we're. He predicted you to be a part of the church. So it is now your mission to share that faith. And you know what? It's going to go on. The church, Jesus is going to build his church. I don't think the glory days of Bethany are in the past. I think the glory days of of Bethany are still in the future. When we become that Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-teaching, Bible-sharing of our faith in in Jesus Christ with everyone, when we are no longer adding, leave it for the pastor to do or the staff, but we are all multiplying. We're all going out and inviting people to receive Jesus Christ. We're inviting people to come to church. We're inviting and we're reaching out and touching people's lives and ways, but saying, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus. And we share our faith. We're to do that. The glory days are ahead. I want to talk now about the culmination of the church. If the church wasn't seen in the Old Testament, it starts in the book of Acts. How long does the church go? When will the church end? Does the church end? I want to share with you what I believe is the very first reference in the Bible to the rapture. It's not called the rapture. That's not revealed later, and that comes from the Latin, a rapimur, that is found in the the book of 1 Thessalonians, the, the Latin Vulgate of that. But in this passage, Jesus has gathered his disciples. He's about to go to the cross and die, and he's given the last words of encouragement. And Jesus says this, in my Father's house are many rooms. The Father has a house, It's a mansion. It's loaded with rooms. And he says, if it were not so, I would have told you I'm not lying. I'm shooting straight. He says, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. I'm going to get the room ready. Now, we know what that's like at our house. We get the room ready for guests. And if there are grandkids, we know it only stays ready for about 10 minutes. (laughs) Because what happens is, man, they just... Go through the whole house and there's things just left everywhere. It's just a grand wreck. But we do it every time. We get everything ready and prepared. That's what he says. I'm going to prepare for you. Where's he preparing for you? Well, in his Father's house in heaven. Now, here we have something you don't read anywhere in the Old Testament. You never read this anywhere before this. He says, and if I go to prepare the place for you, 
I will come back, and here it is. Old Testament talks about coming back, God coming. But take you to be with me. I'm going to come back and take you back to heaven. All the Old Testament prophecies of the coming of Messiah is that he comes and he establishes a kingdom here on earth. This Jesus gives a new wrinkle. He's saying, my people, the church, I am coming back to gather you to go back to heaven to be with me. We have called this doctrine the rapture, at least the theologians have. What we have here is he says, from the day of Pentecost all the way down to the present, and however long it takes, but the church will culminate. The church age will end when Jesus comes back and he calls us home and we go back to heaven with Jesus. In fact, the Bible's going to say, and we're going to be with him forever. Wherever he goes, whatever he does, we're with him forever. We're with him forever. We're going to explore more of that in the days yet to come. Now, what happens when we go back to see, be with Jesus? Well, a very interesting thing happens. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In the Greek, that's just one word, judgment seat of Christ. It's bema, bema. Judgment seat is just the word bema. The bema was a raised platform. I'm on a bema today. <laughs> it's a raised platform. But it became a raised platform where a judge would sit and he would decide cases. You would go before, in our day, you go before the bar, Right? And that day you went before the Bema, and he would, would judge. But it was also used for the Olympics. And the judge who would be up on a Bema would then pronounce who's the winner. And the winner would come up to the Bema, and he would receive his reward. And that is the New Testament's picture. They would receive a little laurel wreath saying, you were first place, second place, third place. You would get your reward for what you had done in your performance. And watch what it says. For we must all appear before the Bema of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We're going to explore this a little bit more in weeks ahead. But this is a place of being rewarded for what you've done. When you go there, it's not to find out you're not going to be judged and sentenced to hell. It's not a judgment in that sense. It's a reward place. We'll discuss that even more. Well, here's where you're going to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Or you're not going to have a reward. One way or the other, it says, you see, you're saved by the grace of God and that alone. Jesus Christ died on the cross, took away your sins. He bore my wrath. We sang that in one of the songs. He took my wrath on the cross. He bore my wrath. I, I will never, ever be judged for that. I'm going to go to heaven no matter what. It's because of who I believed in that I get to go to heaven and accepted Jesus Christ. But what I've done with my life will get either a reward or lack of it. And so what I've done with my life, whether I've invested it in things that are of eternal value or I've just been temporary, as we talked about two weeks ago, whether I've been wood, hay, and stubble, my life was just junk, or it's been gold, silver, and precious stones, fires put to it, what survives. If you've got the gold, silver, and precious stones, then you will receive a reward. You're going to be rewarded. What you do with your life matters. Not only just for time, but for all eternity. For all eternity. Here's the point. Here's the point I'm trying to make. The church was predicted by Jesus. The church is a fulfilled prophecy. Second thing, the church, Jesus said, you will be witnesses. I notice he says, you will be. Uh, not that, hey, do I have any drafted volunteers out there? You see, you are a witness one way or the other. You're either a good witness for Jesus Christ and people say, oh man, I want to have that same hope that you have. Tell me more about Jesus. And you share with them your faith. Or they say, whatever that guy's got, I don't want it. But your life is a witness. You will be witnesses, he says to me. The church had a definite beginning on the day of Pentecost. It was future to the time of Jesus. He predicted it and it happened. And it will continue and persevere until, just as Jesus said, I'm going to come back and take you to be with me. And then he says, and I will reward you. Oh, the Bible's just got this all here. Here's the point of all this. 
This is to give us hope. To give us hope. In Titus it says, we wait for the blessed hope. This is the blessed hope. Listen to it. He's defining it here. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. When Jesus returns, that glorious appearing, that is my hope. Folks, this is not all there is. There is so much more. So much more. I notice here that he calls Jesus something very special. He calls him our Savior, but he's also our God. The appearing of our great God and Savior, who is Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us, to buy us from all wickedness. He saved us from all that for a purpose, to purify himself a people that are his very own. He died for you to make, make you his very own. And if he's done that, and he said he's coming back, you can count on it. He's coming back to take you home with him. I'm telling you what, we are building. We are building for the future on a glory. That's it, the glorious appearing of our son. That exceeds our glorious past. It exceeds our glorious past. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your word. And as we delve into these teachings a little deeper, Lord, each week, we will find, Lord, that you have a plan and a program. You have a purpose. You have a purpose for everyone that's here. And, Lord, we know that you're working everything together for good. And that ultimately, ultimately, we're going to the house, the Father's house, where there's many rooms that Jesus is preparing for us that we will be with him there forever. Lord, we long for the day when Jesus returns. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.